Shabbat Shalom. Happy Sabbath. We're thankful again that Yah has made it possible that we could come to worship him in the beauty of holiness. This morning, our topic is the life of the flesh. The life of the flesh. So I'd like for you to join me in the book of Leviticus, chapter 17, and we'll re we will read verse 11. Leviticus, chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that make it an atonement for the soul. The life of the flesh is in the blood. As we read that statement, we have come to accept this as, an, as a self-evident statement. Moses, the lawgiver, who received dictation from Yah on Mount Sinai, has here written for us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Therefore, with the inerrancy of scriptures, the combination of this axiom and the collaboratives of the atonement necessitates that we examine the simplicity of this atonement complexity. There are indeed corollaries that comes from the process of the atonement. And the axiom that the life of the flesh is in the blood, is in itself a conundrum that we need to look at. So first, this morning, we will look at the chemistry of the blood. We will look at the chemistry of the blood and how it relates to the creation of man and Yeshua himself who came through the womb of a woman. Thereafter, we will elaborate on the axiom reported by Moses and the genetic transmission of the blood. So, come with me to Matthew, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Because Matthew tells us that, and, and we will read from verse 18. Now the birth of Yeshua, Messiah, was on this wise when his mother, Miriam, was exposed to Joseph. She was engaged to Joseph, as we would say in our time, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Akadash. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, conceived in his mind to put her away privily. He wanted to do it quietly. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of Yah appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, though son of David, fear not to take unto thee, Miriam, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her 
is the Holy Spirit. Wow. Just think that here it is to young people are engaged and the culture says they ought to be faithful to each other. And then suddenly you learn, or at least Joseph learned, uh, that Miriam, as we call her Mary, was a child. And the same things that played on Joseph's mind would perhaps played on our mind. That she was having a relationship with someone else. But then the Holy Spirit appeared unto him and let him know that this is not so. This is not so. But we have to ascertain the rationale behind this situation. What happened? Why did this thing had to happen in the way that it did? Well, we would have to go all the way back to Genesis in chapter 1, and we see that Yah made the heavens and the earth, and when he did, he spoke these things in, into being, and then he said, let light come into existence, because the earth was in darkness. And light came into existence. And what's interesting, this was before the sun was created in the fourth day. So you've got to ask a question, who is the light or what was the light that came into the world? Well, you understand that even better when you read in John chapter 8 when Yeshua said, I am the light of the world. And so you know for sure that back then in Genesis 1, it was Yeshua who came into being because the word says that he was the word. And the word became what? Light. And so you begin to understand now that sound is light. Sound is light at a lower vibration and light is sound at a higher oscillation. Therefore, know this, that all creation, both physical and the manifest spiritual, seen and unseen, are the sum of the greater reality of Yeshua. And so, sound and light are interchangeable. And that's what we captured, or at least Einstein captured in his formula there. You perhaps might be able to see on the board, EMC square, energy equal mass times the speed of light square. Yahweh is the greatest mathematician. And he gives us that formula. He's letting us know back in Genesis that energy, the older spirit, was equal to mass, which is Yeshua, times the speed of light square. Because notice that Yeshua is the word that sometimes we hear words and we, we, we think they're abstract, but, but not with Yah. The word says that when he came, that abstract word that we conceive to be abstract became flesh and dwell among us. So the energy became mass. That's what he's letting us know. That energy became a mass. And why did energy need to become mass? That's what we're dealing with today in our study. Because Adam, our father, who had been given dominion over the earth, he had sinned, and sin then became a genetic transmission. With The word says that when Adam sinned, all human beings sinned. And so our DNA was messed up. Are you with me? And so you also understand that red is the frequency 
of light. Our blood is red. But it's the frequency of light. And that light is Yeshua. And so you now understand when Yah in Isaiah 1 and verse 18 said, Come and reason with me because though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Are you with me? And so we come to understand Moses' axiom that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Whether you believe in the medical science, whether you are a biologist or any other sphere of science, the blood is important. You go to the doctor, one of the first things they do, they do a blood test. If only you know that the same blood test is done by Yeshua on the faithful. Whose blood are you with? And so the point is that because Adam sinned and by one man Paul have sinned because all of us were tied up in the loins of Adam. That means the a generation, the old generation unfolding, we're doomed. Every man who has ever bo been born is born dead. Are you with me? We're all born dead. And that's why we need to be reborn, the new birth. So Adam sinned. And all life was on a slippery slope. Because Adam's blood became tainted with sin. And so because... Istin is tainted, and all beings are in Adam because the word says he made all nation of one of people with one blood. I hear people talk about racism, and I ask myself, what do they really mean? Because he only made one race of people, but he made different nations of people with one blood. So, because humankind or mankind, we were all now messed up because the blood is tainted, he had to find a new way of repairing that situation. And so, we want to look at the chemistry of the blood. And so the word says that rather than cause everyone to be doomed, Yah decided that he would send a Messiah. But that Messiah, when he comes, he could not come through the same means as Adam did. He could not be the Messiah if he had the same blood as Adam. Because Adam's blood is tainted and everyone who comes through Adam, even the young baby, is also tainted with sin. So sin comes through the blood and not through the flesh. Are you with me? And so Yeshua had to be born by a virgin. So while he takes on the form of a human being in terms of the flesh, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, was the one who impregnated Mary, therefore ensuring that he would not take the blood of Adam. 
So he came in the flesh like us, but the blood was untainted because she conceived or she was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so let's look at it by way of how a woman goes through a pregnancy and what happens in life, real life, so we can pragmatize the situation and understand it through the works or the roles of the placenta. One of the placenta's jobs is to make sure the blood from the mother's fetus never mixes with the infant child. The placenta acts as an exchange surface between the mother and the fetus. Nutrients and oxygen are passed over by diffusion only. If the mother's and the fetus blood mix, it could be deadly for both of them. If the mother and the fetus are different blood type, they might both die if their blood mixes. That's why most often people do paternity tests rather than maternity tests to determine the what? Identity of the child. Because the placenta is there to make sure that the blood don't mix. The blood of the mother, the blood of the child. Because what if the mother has a different blood type than the child? And so while Yeshua came through Miriam or Mary, the blood type that he had was that of the Holy Spirit, which is different from Adam. Because he had to be the spotless lamb, and he had to come from a gene pool that was untainted so that he could pay the price for our sins. And so as we look towards the Day of Atonement, we come to understand the possibility of atonement, why it is possible because Yeshua came with untainted blood. In fact, the word atonement is an Anglo-Saxon word meaning at one meant. The word there was coined by Tyndale, William Tyndale in about 1530. He was going through and he was writing, translating the Holy Scriptures into English. And so he thought I would coin a word meaning the same thing of Yom Kippur. And he coined the word meaning atonement. So it's not that old a word, relatively. It was he who also coined the term the scapegoat. In fact, he called it the escape goat, which we will look at differently. But I want to look at the chemistry of the blood, the chemistry of the blood. So, blood, that's where the life is. And, and Yah makes it clear that we ought not to eat blood. We ought not to do that. We ought not to, those of you who eat agis and all that kind of stuff, he said, we should not eat blood. Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. So, when Yeshua came into the world, he came in spotless because he had come to atone for all mankind yes he did 
So it is definitely known that the blood which flows in an unborn baby's artery and vein is not derived from the mother, but it is produced within the body of the fetus itself. Only after the introduction of the male sperm and unfertilized ovum can never develop blood since the female egg does not by itself contain the elements essential for the production of this blood. It is only after the male element has entered the ovum that blood can develop. As a very simple illustration of this, think of the egg of a hen, a chicken, an unfertilized egg is just an ovum on a much larger scale than the human ovum. You may incubate this unfertilized hen's egg, but it will never develop. It will decay and become rotten, but no chick will result from it. Are you with me? So let the egg be fertilized by the introduction of a male sperm and the incubation will bring to light the presence of life in that egg. And so we go back to Genesis because, uh, you know, the word says in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we read those words. He says, and Yah made man in his what? In his own image. And, and the word in, as we read chapter 2 as well, he tells us how he formed Adam from the clay. He tells us that, that he formed Adam from the clay. But the word says that Adam was no more than a piece of clay until Yah breathed into him. Are you with me? He molded him and like a potter in a potter's house. That's how he molded Adam. But Adam lay there still. There was no life in him. And the word says that Yah breathed into his nostrils and he became what? A living soul. Now, that ought to stop you and pull back your own cognitive levers and ask yourself a question. Adam is there on the ground, as we perceived, but there is no life in him. He is just a carcass. But then the Messiah, because he was the one who gave life, breathe into his nostril and he became a living soul. And so you must conclude, therefore, that Yah did not only breathe breath into Adam, but he breathed blood into him. Because if the life of the flesh is in the blood, and if there was no blood in Adam, then he would not be alive. So when he breathed into him, he breathed also blood into him, because the life of the flesh is in the blood. But as I indicated, when that blood became messed up, like a cesspool because of sin, because chapter 3 of Genesis said, because the the serpent was more subtle. Hear me? The serpent was more subtle than all the beasts in the field. And Sister Maddox mentioned this uh, this morning, but she did not dilate upon the process. Uh, uh, what happened there? You know, there, there was this bird in the tree. And perhaps you know this, but let me say it again, and I don't want to bore you with it, that angels, spirit beings, when they come to the earth, they need a body to dwell in. Because it is one of the requirements on earth, by Yah, that any spirits that come to the earth to have domicile, they must come 
in the form of a body. So Satan being a spirit, he was entering into the body of the serpent. The serpent was not always a serpent. The serpent was originally a bird that spoke. I want you to understand that. So Satan was squatting in that bird and it was at the curse that it became a serpent and began to crawl on its body. Are you with me? So Yeshua being the word that we conceive to be abstract, but the word had to come to save us. So the word, which is a spirit, had to come in the form of a body. So he take on the form of a body, but he came through the blood of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way he could cleanse us from our sins. And so we need to understand that process. So how wonderfully Yah prepared for the virgin birth of his son. When he created the woman, he made her so that no blood would be able to pass from her to the offspring. Did you hear me? That blood is the result of a male. Since Adam was the federal head of the race, it is his blood which transmits Adam's sin in order to produce sinless man and yet be the son of Adam. Yahweh, Yeshua must provide a way whereby the man would have a human body derived from Adam but have not a drop of Adam's sinful blood. That's what the atonement is all about. We're all children of Adam. And I hear people say, you know, we are cr created in in Yah's image. Technically, that's not true. Adam was creating in Yah's image. But when Adam sinned, Adam could only reproduce his own image. Because the word says in Genesis chapter 5, that when he had set, set was in his likeness and in his image, not the image of Yah. The only way we become like Yah, we have become by way of adoption to the acceptance of Yeshua. Amen. That is how... We are made, or I should say remade, in Yah's image. So if you're only born once, I hear people say, well, you know, I'll take my chances. If you're born once, you will die twice. You will not only die on the day appointed for you to die, but you will die the second death. But if you're born twice, not only the biological birth, but if you're born again, that's what Nicodemus didn't understand, you'll only die once perhaps. Not everybody will die, because the word said that when he comes, some will be alive and will be caught up to meet him in the air. So understand the chemistry of the blood, the blood of Yeshua, and the blood of human beings. Because we all carry the DNA of Adam. We carry the sin because he only made one flesh. So in Adam, all people die, but in Yeshua, all of us will live. And he said he will give us life. And how will he give it? Abundantly. And so we need to understand that. And so in order to be saved in the kingdom, we would say it is an essential condition that is absolutely necessary. We would call it a sine qua non. It is a sine qua non. It, it is absolutely necessary for us to live. So the word said in 1 John 4 and verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit. Are you with me? And you read that, but perhaps you didn't grasp it. The reason we ought not to believe every spirit, because spirits, they have to get into a body to have domicile on the earth. Now, when Satan went into the body of the serpent, he should not have believed Satan. Believe not every spirit, but what? Test every spirit. 
But Eve did not do that. And so we're in this process now where we need to be atoned. And so I would like you to join me in chapter 16 of the book of Leviticus. Chapter 16. Because the atonement is very important. Very important. So, chapter 16 of Leviticus tells us that, and Yahweh spake unto Moses, Moses, after the death of the two sons and Aaron, when they offered before Yahweh and died, and Yahweh said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he came not at all in the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is up on the heart, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. That's a meeting place. Yah wants to meet us in the, in the meeting place where? In the most holy of places. But he tells, her, he tells them that they ought to what? They ought to make an atonement for the people. They ought to do that. And they ought to get what? Two goats. They ought to get two goats. And make that atonement for the people. Now, most people that I know will tell you that the atonement was completed at Calvary. But my answer to them would be, according to Hebrews 8.4, Yeshua was not a priest while he was on earth. So who made the atonement at Calvary? Because atonement is the work of a priest. Very simple. If you've understood the sanctuary, you will know that Israel, day after day, the people have been sinned. They would bring an animal and they would bring that animal to atone for their sin or for the forgiveness of their sins, I should say. And they would have forgiveness each day. But every year on the 10th day of the 7th month, there would be an atonement, whereas you're not only asking for forgiveness, you get forgiveness every day, but you need the blotting out of your sins. And so I say to people, often times, that if your sins are only forgiven, you're still in bad shape. Your sins need to be expunged from the record. That's what the atonement does. And next Wednesday, the 10th day of the seventh month, that's the atonement when the books are open and your records come up in review before Yah and your records are looked at and Yah will determine whether you live or whether you die. That's what the atonement, it's a day of judgment. But most people who go to church, they say it doesn't matter. And Yah says in Leviticus chapter 23, this is my feast. Moses, I want this to happen. And I want it to be what? For all generations. I want my people to come and meet with me on the 10th day of the seventh month. But because Satan has put you on a different calendar, put you on a Gregorian calendar rather than the biblical calendar, you miss these things and you go to church and you're happy clappy and doing okay, but you are not under the covenant with him because you are not obeying him. Understand that. And so the process of the atonement was that you would get, they would get two goats. And they would drew, draw lots and decide that one goat, well, let, let, let's turn to verse um, 20 of chapter 16. Well, 
Let's look at verse 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people. And you know what? Let's give it some context. Let's go above that. Verse 11. And Aaron shall bring the bullocks of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for the house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before Yah, and his ange full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense up on the fire before Yah, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that is he die not. And he shall take of the blood, there it is again, of the bullock, and sprinkle it with the finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Verse 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring the blood within the veil, and do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall take, make an atonement for the holy place, and because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of the transgressions and the sin, and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the, conversa for the convocation. Verse 20, And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and of all the transgression in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the end of a fit man into the wilderness. Now, let's examine that. This is a shadow, remember. And the shadow points to greater works that were to come through the Messiah. So Aaron would get two goats. And these goats had to be unblemished. And like in similarity, height, weight, and everything said the word. And so when they have found these two goats, one is the scapegoat, as um, Tinde would call it, the escape goat. And one would be for the goat of Yah Yahweh. They would kill the goat of Yahweh. But the scapegoat would go into the wilderness. Not the churches now, they teach that the goat, one goat is for Yahweh and one is for Satan is Azazel. That, that's the term used, Azazel. So just think of that. You are a descendant of Adam. You have messed up like I have. And you want to realign yourself back to Yahweh and you've accepted the word. And in obedience, you are now keeping the feast days not precluding the Day of Atonement. And so you come. But then the church teaches that the scapegoat is Satan. Remember, although there are two goats, there's one offering. There's one offering. Are we to assume that Satan is part of our atonement? Are we to assume that? Now understand that Satan is in the sanctuary making atonement for you. That's what the churches teach. And so 
when the scapegoat is set upon and all the sins of the people are put on the scapegoat, the scapegoat was then taken into the wilderness. Hear me? Into the wilderness. And what the, what the, the, the so-called Jews do today, they push the goat over the cliff. That's not biblical. The Bible says the goat will be let go into the wilderness by the end of a fit man. And the journey of the scapegoat, understand where I'm going with this. When the scapegoat is taken into the wilderness, the journey of the scapegoat would be what? Five Sabbath days. Five Sabbath days. So come with me. Let me explain this a little bit further. Come with me to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 4. Luke and chapter 4. Because I want to show you that the scapegoat is not Satan. But both goats represent the Messiah because it's one offering. And while he is the goat for Yahweh that was killed, sacrificed, he is also the life goat that went into the wilderness. And you say, how so? Come with me to Luke, Luke chapter 4. And the word says, in verse 1, and Yeshua, being full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Did you hear me? He's playing the role now here in Luke as the lifeboat. Where did it go? Into the wilderness. Being 40 days tempted by the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. Do you understand what I just said? He said he went into the wilderness for how long? 40 days. And remember I read earlier and I said in chapter 16 that the journey of the scapegoat will be five Sabbaths. How many Sabbaths in 40 days? Five. And, and so you see here, he's playing the role of the scapegoat led out by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. It is not Satan. When we read the book of Isaiah chapter 53, we better go there because we, we want to clear up any discrepancies that may exist in people's minds over the year that Satan is making atonement for them. Satan cannot make atonement for you. Uh, uh, well, let me ask you a question before I even read Isaiah. Let me, let me just ask you a question. What is a scapegoat? A scapegoat is usually, in terms of how we use it, someone who is blamed unfairly for something that they didn't do. Isn't that right? Often we, in, in, in figure of speech, we say we're using such and such a person as a scapegoat. A scapegoat is one who is unfairly blamed, blamed for something that they didn't do. So then, how could Satan be a scapegoat? Is he blameless? Come on. The Bible says that Satan is the arch deceiver. He's a liar from the very beginning. He is the one who is the accuser of the brethren. He who is the one who prosecutes your case. And you are saying he makes atonement for you? Come on, think again. He could never be the scapegoat. So come with me to Isaiah chapter 53. And by the way, this is the chapter that our brother, the Ethiopian eunuch, was reading when Philip met him in Gaza. He was reading because he wanted to ascertain for himself who is the scapegoat. <laughs> you know, who is this Messiah to which you refer? Let's read. Isaiah writes, Who hath believed? Our report. And to whom is the arm of Yah revealed? For he shall grow up.
before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Verse 3, he is despised and, what? Rejected of man, man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces on him. He, he, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our grief and carried our sorrow, yet we did not esteem him stricken, smitten, of ya and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He's the one who carried all our infirmities and all our iniquities. It was on him that our sins, our infirmities, our iniquities was placed. This scapegoat, not Satan. And so when the church says, teach you that Satan, that your sins were put on Satan and they were taken into the wilderness, Isaiah wants you to know not so. This is the scapegoat. All we like sheep, verse 6 tells us, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and Yah has laid on him. Yah did what? Laid on him what? The iniquity of us all. Yah had put our iniquities, our sin on him, says Isaiah chapter what? 53 and verse 6. Not Satan. So go back and tell your bishop that if Satan is making atonement for him, you're not going to let Satan make atonement for you. You're going to keep the day of atonement on the 10th day of the seventh month. So here it is. Very logical. Because we've, we've said truth has to be logically consistent. And, and truth has to be what? Emphatically adequate. And it has to be experientially, existentially relevant to the times in which you're living. So when they taught you that Satan is Azazel, you could say, no, not so. And then you take them to the book of Luke chapter 4 and then to Isaiah chapter 53 and you demonstrable show that your scapegoat, your goat that was led into the wilderness by a fit man, the Holy Spirit, is Yeshua and not Satan. Because we read in the book of Revelation that Satan will be destroyed by fire. And so we must think again. We must think of what the word of Yah is saying. So the word is this. You better come with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, because a lot of people have used this text. They've read it, and they have butchered it. Colossians chapter 2, and come with me to verse 14, and we'll read on. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. And they say, this is the law. No. The law was never against you. The law was there to protect you. That's the Ten Commandments. Which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailed it on the cross. You hear people say the law was nailed to the cross. They have not, no idea of what they're saying. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Verse 16, come with me. Let no one condemn you regarding sacrificial meal and drink. Offerings made on the holy days, new moons, and Sabbath. He said, what you do and the food you eat, let no one judge you against that on these holy days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is in Messiah. Some say the body is in Messiah. Understand what he's saying. He's saying, when I called Moses to make me a tabernacle, 
according to Exodus 24, 25, I should say in verse 8, he says to, to Moses, make me a tabernacle that I may dwell with you, that I may teach you the mechanics of salvation, including what the atonement really means. This is a shadow, but the shadow work that is being done by Moses, greater is to come. So again, let me emphasize the point that all we're doing is rehearsing for the great event. And he told Moses, when you make this tabernacle, make sure you make it after the tabernacle, the pattern that is in heaven. Now, in Colossians 2, 16, he's telling you, let's read it again for emphasis. Let no one condemn you regarding the sacrificial meal and drink offering made on the holy days, new moons and Sabbaths. Why? He says, these are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is Messiah. So the question is, who cast the shadow? Who cast the shadow? The head. Yeshua cast the shadow. Where does he cast the shadow? On his body. Who is the body? If Yeshua, the church. So if the head casts the shadow, what should the body do? Are you with me? Let me say it this way. Let's assume that you were coming up the street at noontime one day in Florida and the sun was hot. It's 95 degrees, even in the shade. And you were at a distance from me and I saw a shadow of you coming. When you get near to me, I see the real thing. What then do I do with your shadow? Do I get rid of your shadow? You cannot get rid of your shadow if the head cast it. Silly Galatians. No. So when Messiah cast the shadow, and, and, and look what the shadows he cast, according to verse 16, right? What does he say? Verse 16 says he cast what? The shadow of the moons and the Sabbath, the feast day. That's what he cast on the churches. And the churches said, they don't know we, we won't keep them. Tell me how that is logical. That's confused logic, isn't it? And, and, and so you see the discrepancies here. Because he's saying, you have missed all these things. And, and, and therefore, I want to turn... Your scarlet colored sins into whiteness, purity. And now you understand that the cord, scarlet cord that was tied on the goat's head when the offering was made and it was received by Yah, uh, that scarlet cord would turn white. But after Yeshua himself was crucified, and Yah stopped accepting animal sacrifice, it no longer did that. It no longer did that. So come with me now to the, back, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. Then verily, the first covenant had also orders to service and the world of sanctuary. The writer here of Hebrew, which I believe is Luke, some say it's Paul, or many say it's Paul, but I have good reason to believe it's Luke. Then verily the first covenant had also orders of service, a worldly sanctuary. Paul says the first sanctuary was worldly. It was on the earth. If you believe it's Paul, that is, I would say Luke says. For in the first compartment of the tabernacle were the candlestick, the table, and the showbread, which is called the holy place. This is where the people would go with their animal each day in Israel. And that would continue for a whole, whole year. But on the 10th day of the seventh month, not the priest now, but the high priest would make the atonement for them. That's what Yeshua is doing for us now because he is the high priest. And that's what Hebrews chapter 9 is trying to tell us. Verse 3. 
And beyond the veil, the second compartment of the tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies, which had the gold incense on the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manner and Aaron's rod that budded and the, the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always in the first tabernacle according to the service. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year. How often? Once every year on the tenth day of the seventh month. Not without blood, which he or offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Spirit signifying this, that the way into the holy of holies was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. Did you get that? The word here says, while the tabernacle on earth existed, this was a shadow. What was going on in the holy place in heaven was not made known to you. It was not manifest. Did you get that? It was only after that was done away with, then you understand the work that was being done in that earthly sanctuary is now being done in the heavenly sanctuary because Moses was told when you make the tabernacle make it after the pattern of the one in heaven so let me read that again for you he says verse 8 of chapter 9 the Holy Spirit signifying this that the way into the holy of holies was not made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing that's Moses tabernacle which was a figure for the time then present. It's a shadow for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect and pertaining to the conscience. Why could it not make perfect? Because they were using the blood of bulls and goats. And that could not cleanse what Adam had, did, had done in chapter 3 of Genesis. Because all our DNA were messed up and it needed somebody with had blood that was not tainted. And that's why Yeshua came into the world by the work of the Holy Spirit. He came as a human being in the flesh, but the blood that he had was composed of the Holy Spirit. Because the blood of Mary, because Mary is a descendant, or, or I should say Miriam, that's her proper name. The blood of Miriam, his mother, could not be mingled with the blood of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it would taint the whole process. Are you with me? He came unto his own, and his own received them not. Let's read on. Verse 10 of chapter 9, which stood only in meat and drink offerings and the various washing and carnal ordinances. What? Let's read that again because you miss it. Which stood only in meal and drink offerings and various washing and carnal ordinances, imposing them until the time of reformation. He's letting you know that the Levitical order right was imposed on them whereas we read in exodus chapter 19 that the melchizedek order was a covenant he offered it and they accepted it but this one was given was imposed because they broke the first covenant and when yeshua come he restored the melchizedek order now as you look at it you ask yourself, when I read the Melchizedek order, I don't see any types in it. The only way I find, the only place I find type is in the Levitical order. Are you with me? So one has to conclude 
that the types that we find in the Levitical order are pertaining to the same types in heaven. Moses, when you make this thing, make it after the pattern that is in heaven. So the types remain, but the priesthood is Melchizedek. Are you with me? No Aaronic priesthood, Melchizedek priesthood, but the types of Aaron. Are you getting that? There is no types in Melchizedek order. And Moses was told, when you make it, make it after the same pattern. The Messiah, when he comes, he must go into the first apartment, then the second apartment, and then make an atonement for the people. He can now make the atonement because he has perfect blood. The ones that were made in Moses' time could only be temporary because they were using the blood of bulls and gold. So come with me to chapter 10 of, Gen uh, of um, Hebrews, and we'll read verse 4. For it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. It can't happen. Wherefore, when he comes into the world as Yeshua, he said, sacrifices and offering. Thou didst not desire mine ears as thou pierced, burnt offering and sin offering as thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come into the volume of the book. It is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O Yahweh. Above, when he said, Sacrifices an offering and burnt offering, even for sin, thou wouldest not, neither didst need addest pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O Yahweh. He take it away the first, that's the tabernacle, the first tabernacle, that he may establish the second, that's the one in heaven. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, that's Yeshua, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of Yahweh from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. To get that? He came into the world, as I indicated earlier. That the word, now you can't see word because they're abstract. You can speak them and you can hear the sound of them as they go out. And we can transmit that sound off the word at a lower oscillation because that becomes light. And so when Yah in Genesis 1 says, let there be light. He spoke the word. Who is the word? Yeshua. And Yeshua became what? The light of the world. And that was before the sun was made on the fourth day. And so the light came into the darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend the light. What was in darkness? The world was in darkness, says Genesis 1 and verse 2. Are you with me? So the energy as we said, is equal to mass. So when you go back to his crucifixion, you understand what happened there, right? Mass is this. Mass is tangible. He died as a mass, but he rose as an energy. Are you with me? Because you will understand, let's go there, that on one particular occasion, the disciples were in a room. You remember that occasion? And when he got there, the word said, 
the room was closed. And he entered into the room with closed door. And they were amazed. And they asked, really, how did this happen? Because as a spirit, structures cannot enter him. Are you with me? And so we go back to this. Energy is equal to mass. He rose as, you know, a spirit, but he went down into the tomb as mass. E equals what? MC squared. And so we've got to understand that what actually happened when Yeshua came changed the whole complexion of life in terms of how we see it. That man was doomed. Why? Because the substance of his life, his blood, was all tainted. And it didn't matter where he went to. It wouldn't be made any different. He needed a totally blood transfusion. And that blood transfusion could only come through the Messiah himself, who had, what? Untainted blood. And who has the type of blood that you need, the same blood group. And so when he came through the womb of Miriam, the substance of his blood was derived from the Holy Spirit and not of Adam. And that's what we come on Wednesday for. We will come on Wednesday for to be atoned because during the course of the year, our sins come up before him and he's asked us to come to court on Wednesday to see whether we have stayed with the program. But as you know, over the years, people say it doesn't matter. And they don't turn up. And so he has them in contempt of court. They are made contempt of court. And then a decree goes out for them. And who knows what will happen to them? Are you with me? So turn with me to Romans 5 as we close. Romans 5. Paul here writes. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, as Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Understand, as a consequence of Adam's sin, Every man was sentenced to death. Because what? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of Yah is eternal life. Verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned. After the similitude of Adam's transgression, there it is. Who is the figure of him that was to come? Adam was a figure, was a shadow of the real Adam. That's why Yeshua is called the last Adam. So where this Adam failed, he had to succeed. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of Yahweh and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Yeshua the Messiah, hath abounded unto many. So, the thought is this as we close. You have lived your life. 
And you've gone through life at breath-taking speed. And you've tried almost everything. And nothing has worked. All you've had is pain and distress. And you're wondering now, perhaps you're in your 50s, 60s, maybe even 70s. And you're wondering, what must I do? Do as Peter said, repent. And give your life to Yeshua so that you may be baptized in the name of Yeshua. It is simple. And, and I heard you to do this before doomsday. Avoid the rush before doomsday. Very simple. The lifestyle you're living, examine it and find out whether it pleases you. Are you living in adultery? Are you living in fornication? Are you stealing? The life you're living, does it measure up? Is it consistent with the word? Because you will be judged by the word. We are in the 10th day of all, and the next when? Wednesday will be the day of atonement. It's the day of judgment. When the books will close. The judgment is set. Well. Let's just show you what I mean. Come with me. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And we'll read it. Verses 9 and 10. Daniel says. What does he say? And I what? Be held. And what? Thrones were cast down. And read for me somebody from, from, your, from your scriptures so that it becomes interactive. Daniel 7, 9, and 10. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. Mm -hmm. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Mm -hmm. The judgment was set and the books were opened. Here it is. I beheld, the prophet says, till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the air of his head like pure wool is thrown like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. He's talking about Wednesday coming. And, and listen to verse 13 now. He says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like what? The Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days at the father, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Did you hear that? That's the judgment. And that's taking place on Wednesday, the 10th day of the seventh month. Remember, Daniel is a prophetic book, an end time book that was closed before. It's now open to your understanding. Don't go telling people that these things are done away with. So, what can I say? Other than to say, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Not in Adam's blood, 
but in the blood that Yeshua imputes into us that gives us life so that we may have life. And how do we have it? In abundant fashion. May this find a fertile place in your heart. May your senses converge to understand what the word is saying. And he that hath and hear to hear, let him hear what the Ruach Akadas says. In Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. Amen.